We are continuing our study of the wonderful word of God. And as you know, the theme, the theme of this year's camp meeting is saved by grace. Saved by grace. It's an interesting theme which is actually inspired by Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amazing passage of scripture which tells us a lot of things about how we are saved. For instance, we are saved by grace, saved through faith, saved as a gift, saved not of works, saved for God, and saved unto good works. Dear brothers and sisters, we have some very interesting topics that we've been considering all through the course of this week on the subject of the amazing grace of God by which we are saved. We looked at the contours of saving grace, contours of saving grace. We also looked at the concept of saving grace, the concept of saving grace, and then the conduit of saving faith. The conduit of saving faith. And our last study was captioned, the contribution of God's saving gift. The contribution of God's saving gift. An interesting study which was based on the line in chapter 2 verse 8 of Ephesians that says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. After having established uh, what the antecedent of, uh, of the demonstrative pronoun that and the pronoun eight actually is in that particular text, we went on to look at two important points. The two points are the refutation of man's contribution to his salvation. The refutation or the negation of man's contribution to his salvation. We look at the fact that self-salvation is silly because it is futile. We also said it is silly because sinners are sold under sin. In other words, we are depraved. After looking at the refutation of man's contribution to his salvation, we look at the revelation of God's contribution to man's salvation. And I should actually qualify that by saying the revelation of God's soul contribution to man's salvation. And under that, you, we look at the Savior as the gift of God, the Spirit as the gift of God, and the sinner's response to God's gift as the gift of God. Dear brothers and sisters, we are continuing our study of God's Word today, and uh, I wish to welcome you to verse 2 of Ephesians, uh, sorry, verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, the last, I think, four days, we actually have been in the, just one verse of the book of Ephesians. So a very warm welcome to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 9. And we are going to discuss that text under the theme, the corruption of men's self-saving works. The corruption of men's self-saving works. And as I said, our text is Ephesians chapter 2, 
verse number 9, but we are actually going to read verses 8 and 9. So if you will, kindly flip the pages of your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And as you do that, let me again affirm my belief in the Bible as the Word of God. Friends, I believe the primacy of the Bible, that the Bible is the ultimate authority. If you believe that woman can't, let's say amen. I also affirm the supremacy of the Bible, that this Bible is sufficient, or the sufficiency of the Bible, that it is sufficient to make one wise unto salvation. If you believe that woman can't, let's say amen. And finally, I affirm the totality of the Bible, that all Scripture comprising the Old and the New Testaments and 66 books is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the child of God may be thoroughly furnished for all good works. If we believe that, we may kindly say amen. So with that conviction, we're going to read the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I will read verse 8, and we will read together verse number 9. If that is clear, say amen. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Let us read together. Not of works lest anyone should boast. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's going to be our focus text or focal text today. And the topic is the corruption of men's self-saving works. Let's ask the Lord to lead us as we study. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your wonderful word of life. As we study your word today, we ask that the Holy Spirit, who inspired your word, will illuminate Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. And as it has pleased you to use a frail, filthy, and feeble vessel as myself, I do not ask for mighty words of men's wisdom to move the audience, or ask, O oh Lord, let humanity diminish and let divinity dominate that you will speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally in the name of Jesus. Let God's people say amen. The corruption of men's self-saving works. Dear brothers and sisters, the truth is, if you do a careful analysis of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 are concerned with theology. Chapter 2, verse 10 is concerned with ethics. So this is the last theological portion of our study Going forward into chapter 2, verse 10, we will be looking at the application, the practice of the grace of God. Actually, verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians chapter 2 are concerned with the position of grace. What we have become as a result of grace or God's grace, that we have been saved and then verse 10 is about the practice of grace, what we do because of the grace of God. And so as we critically examine Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9, we're going to see two things standing out. We're going to see two important points. The first is the corruption of self-saving works. The corruption of self-saving works. And the second is, the second is the corruption of self-congratulating words. Self-congratulating words. Those are the two we're going to look at today. So if you will, come with me to the text. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 9. 
The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved. That is in verse number 8. Okay. Through faith, not of works, lest anyone, I mean, not of, uh, through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Then verse 9 says, not of works. Not of works. So as we look at that verse, uh, that first part of the verse, we actually see the corruption of self-saving works. The corruption of self-saving works. The Bible says, not of works. You are saved, not of works. Oh, my dear friends, the word not there indicates absolute negation absolute negation god is negating any possibility or even probability that one would be saved by his own works he says not of works oh my dear brothers and sisters that you know expression uh, which literally means not out of work not from work not in the context of work, actually serve as a marker that denotes the origin or the source of our salvation. In other words, what the apostle is saying is, works are not the origin, works are not the source of our salvation. Works are not the origin, works are not the source of our salvation. He is implying that salvation is a gift of God and it does not find its source in man. Furthermore, this salvation is not out of the source of works. It explains, therefore, that salvation is by God's unmerited favor, which is called grace. It is not produced by man, nor is it earned by man. My dear brothers and sisters, when the Bible says, not of yourselves, he is saying it is not produced by you. Not of works, it is not earned by you. It is not out from you, it is not out from you as a source, because it is the gift of God. Brothers and sisters, salvation is not out of works. This is reiterated several times by the Apostle Paul. It is not produced by man, and it is not earned by man. So when the Apostle Paul says, not of yourselves, he is saying, it is not produced by you. When he says, not by works, he is saying, it is not earned by you. Salvation is not produced by you, and it is not earned by you. If that is clear, say amen. Not of works. Not of works. Now, works actually refer to the results of any activity in which one exerts strength, energy, or faculties to do or to perform something. Salvation is not of works, as Paul tells us. The corruption of self-saving works. Now, why is salvation not of works? I give you two reasons. Salvation is not of works because works cannot justify us. Works cannot justify us. The Bible says in Romans, Romans chapter 3 verses 19 and 20, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds or the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. My dear brothers and sisters, salvation is not of works because works cannot justify you. Works cannot justify me. I give you another reason, um, uh, uh, rather another text. We cannot be, we are justified not by works. The Bible says in Romans, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, 
but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. He who does not work, but simply believes on the one who works for us. He simply believes the one by whom we are justified. The Bible says his faith, his belief is accounted for righteousness. The apostle illustrated that with Abraham when he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Works cannot justify us. Let me be specific. Sabbath observance cannot justify us. Observing the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue cannot justify us. Coming to church on time cannot justify us. As good as all of those are, they cannot be the basis for our being right with God. Hello, New Life Seventh-day Adventist Church. Are you with me? Are you with me? We are not justified by works, my dear brothers and sisters. Works cannot justify us. Here is another text, Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. The Bible says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Are you there with me, brothers? Are you there with me, sisters? So the first reason why we cannot be saved by works the first reason why salvation is not by works is we are not justified by works. Here is the second reason. Works, works cannot save us. Works cannot save us. For the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began he saved us not according to our works well here you are Titus Titus chapter 3 verse number 5 Titus chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. We are not saved by works of our righteousness, but by his mercy, he saved us. Two reasons. Number one, works cannot justify us. Cannot make us to be right before God. Two, works cannot save us. And brothers and sisters, the question then would be, why is it that my works cannot gain the acceptance of God, the approval of God? Or why is it that my works cannot make me right before God? Well, friends, in the book of Isaiah... Isaiah 64, verse 6, the Bible says, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. In other words, our righteousness, self-righteousness is filthy. Our righteousness is like a filthy rag. Now, that is a very strong statement. As a matter of fact, if you go into the Hebrew language in which Isaiah wrote his book, the word filthy is translated of the Hebrew ada. Now, ada literally means the bodily fluid from a woman's menstrual cycle. 
That's what the text means. The word rag is a translation of begad. And it actually means a rag or a garment. Therefore, these righteous acts are considered by God as repugnant. Our self-righteousness is repugnant before God. It is soiled just like a feminine hygiene product. Oh, brothers and sisters, on our own, our righteousness is simply self-righteousness. And therefore, it is vain. It is hypocritical. It is a vain religion. It is a hypocritical religion that produces nothing more than filthy rags. Our works cannot save us. No, not at all. Dear brothers and sisters, the story is told of a man who came early, I mean eagerly. He came running uh, to a revival meeting. But unfortunately, he was late. He found the workmen actually breaking down the tent that they had actually used for the revival meeting. And so this man was very frantic in asking uh, that the men that were breaking down the tents would allow him to join them in doing some work so that he too can get some merits of God's blessings. So the workman looked at him for a long time and said to him, you can't do anything, it's too late. Then he responded, very horrified, what do you mean? How can it be too late? Then the workman said to him, there is nothing you need to do but believe it. There is nothing you need to do but believe it. Why? Because the work has already been accomplished. Brothers and sisters, the work for our redemption has been accomplished on the cross of Calvary where our substitute died in our place. All you need to do is to believe it. Isaiah says, who has believed our report? And what is the report? He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that should have brought us peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. That healing is not physical healing. Though you can apply the text to physical healing. That healing is spiritual healing from our sin malady, from our sin sickness. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Peter uses the same word when he says, with his stripes, we were healed. We are purified from our sin sickness. Brothers and sisters, I like this statement. A statement made by D.L. Moody. He said that thief had nails through both hands so that he could not work. And a nail through each foot so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or a foot toward his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God. And he took it. Christ threw to him a passport. And he will use that passport to enter into paradise. Not of works, lest any man should boast. When the Bible says, lest anyone should boast, God is now speaking about the corruption of self-congratulating words. The corruption of self-congratulating words. Brothers and sisters, self-congratulations... Self-congratulations is until complacency or pride regarding one's personal achievement or qualities, what you can call self-satisfaction. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says in our text, remember, from the first part of the text, we saw the corruption of self-saving works. In the second part of the text, the Bible says, lest anyone should boast the corruption of self-congratulating words. Not of works, not what we do. Not of works, lest any man should boast, lest anyone will speak. It has to do with words concerning works. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says, look at it. It says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That word, lest. It's actually so that. It is hina in the Greek. So that. And it expresses purpose of something. 
Well, brothers and sisters, he is saying, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Not of works towards the end that anyone would even boast. Brothers and sisters, he is saying no one should boast about his salvation. The word boast is an interesting word. That word is actually uh, suggesting that one boasts over a privilege or possession. And the idea is to take pride in something. It is to take pride in something. And the Bible says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The word boast is frequently used by the Apostle Paul. He mentions boasting in his letters severally. As a matter of fact, the Greek verb to boast or the nouns meaning boast actually appear 47 times in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And in the book of Ephesians, it is occurring just once. It is in our text, verse number 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. Boasting is actually an outward expression of inward pride. That is boasting, an outward expression of inward pride. Brothers and sisters, what the word of God is saying is no one should boast. And the reason is Paul lived in a culture where boasting was a commonplace. In Paul's day, he lived in what you call an honor shame culture. So boasting was a common practice. It was common as people sought to enhance their social and religious standing by how distinct they were from the rest of the other people. Boasting. Boasting. In Paul's day, the Jewish people were boastful. The Jewish people were boastful. What were they boastful about? Come with me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Romans 2, 17. Indeed, you are called a Jew. The first reason or the first basis of the, 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 the bravado or the, 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 the boastfulness of the Jewish people is that they were called Jew. Just because they were called Jew, they claimed that they had the natural ancestry of Jesus Christ. They claim that they were Abraham's children. They claim that they were the children of God. So they boasted on their national heritage, their national connection. That was not all. The Bible says, and you rest on the law. The next thing they boasted on was what we call, the first one was social uh, uh, boastfulness. The other one is religious boastfulness. They boasted that they rested on the law. They said, we got a law. God gave us the law at Sinai. We are the depositories of his revelation. We are the recipients of his law. They boasted about that. But there is something else they boasted about. The Bible says, and you make your boast in God. Now, one would think that, okay, yeah, it's good to boast in God because uh, 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 Paul says, uh, 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 God forbid that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my Lord. But this boast in God is not boasting in God for God's glory. It is boasting in God for their own glory. The Jewish people actually claimed monopoly over God. For them, God was their personal property. That is why in Acts chapter 15, there was a whole general conference session just to determine whether the Gentiles could also be children of God. Are you kidding me? Whole general conference session, the first general conference session of the church was held in Acts chapter 15 so that they could determine whether the Gentiles could also be children of God. Without going through circumcision, and all those other things. Are you there with me? This reminds me of some Adventists. Are you there with me? Some of us think we have monopoly over God and the gospel. Are you there with me? He said, those Sunday worshipers. Mark of the beast people. We are the remnant church of God. And mind you, it's true. We are the remnant church of God. But should we be, a, should we be bravados? Should we be boastful? Or should we be laboring tirelessly for souls to be one to God's end time people? I see a lot of 
boastfulness in most of us. Bravado. Boastfulness. It says, listen, man, God is our personal property. So in order to be a child of God, you must be proselytized. In other words, we must convert you through circumcision and other things. Well, brothers and sisters, the Jews in Paul's time were boastful. But that is not all. The Gentiles were also boastful. Boastful. Notice what the Bible says. Romans chapter 11 verse 18. Romans chapter 11 verse 18. The Bible says, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the roots. But the roots supports you. Now here is the point. You know the gospel left from the Jewish people. A.D. what? 34. And Paul's ministry and the ministry of others began to go toward Gentiles. And so Antioch was a whole Gentile church. Antioch. Corinthian or Corinth was a whole Gentile church. Rome, Gentile church. All kinds of Gentiles were converted to the kingdom. And guess what? The Gentiles now started putting their shoulders up. We are God's people. You guys rejected God. They begin to add boastful towards the Jewish people. And that is why Paul tells them, don't do that. You have been grafted in. Don't be boastful against the branches. So the Gentiles were boastful. And let me tell you something else they were boastful about. Look at the church in Corinth. Very interesting church. The Bible tells us that those people were bragging about who was their pastor. In Corinth, some said they were of Paul. Others said they were of Apollos. Others said they were of Cephas. So Paul said, what's your problem? Is it Paul who saved you? Is it Apollos who saved you? Is it Cephas who saved you? So brothers and sisters, the Bible says, so that no one will boast. So that the Jew will not boast, the Gentile will not boast. Why? Because all have seen, Gentiles and Jews have seen and fallen short of the glory of God. We are guilty before God. So brothers and sisters, why are we saved? If you do a little diagram of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, you will get this. Put it in uh, what you call a uh, 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 chiastic structure. You will notice that for by grace you have been saved, which is the A point. The A2 is actually so that no man will boast. Meaning that we were saved by grace so that God will eliminate boasting. God saved us by grace alone so that no one may boast. No Gentile can boast that he worked for his salvation. No Jewish man can boast that he worked for his salvation. All of us have been saved by grace alone. Hallelujah. Saved by grace. No boasting. Look at someone and say, no boasting. I mean, talk to the person. No boasting. Hallelujah. Let me tell you a story. The story is told of a Pharisee and a publican. The Pharisee, we will say, is an Adventist pastor or elder. So you have this Adventist pastor or Adventist elder who went to church to pray. They came to New Life Church or Moravia Central Church or somewhere else. They went to church to pray and uh, the, 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 the Gentile, or not Gentile, but the publican, was in church also. The Pharisee was also in church. And the Pharisee began to pray. He prayed first. And notice his prayer. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Did you get his prayer? I am not like other men. I'm not a Sunday keeper, God. Are you there with me? He continues. He said, I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer or even this tax collector. This tax connect collector. And then he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithe of all that I possess. God, think about it. 
Think about it. So this Pharisee had his head unlifted, his hands unlifted, and he was telling God why God must bless him. He was putting his works in front of the face of God. He was making God to be indebted to him because of what he has done. Have you heard yourself say that before? Oh God, give me this job because I am the strongest deaconess in the church. You kidding me? Oh God, I must be saved because I am this and I am that. But the Bible says the publican could not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, it is important to note that the publican did not say, God, give me grace. He said, God, be merciful to me. There's a difference between grace and mercy. Grace is God, I mean, mercy is God not giving to you what you deserve. Grace is God giving to you what you do not deserve. So the publican is saying, Lord, I am guilty of death. I am guilty of destruction. I am guilty of total annihilation. I am guilty of your wrath. But Lord, have mercy. That's what the Bible means when it says it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. And guess what the Bible says? Jesus now gave a commentary on the story. It is in what you call the end stress, the emphasis, the meaning, the moral of the story. He said, I tell you the truth. This publican, when whom, more what? What word is used there? He went home justified. You know what that means? He went home right with God. He went home as if he had never sinned. He went home with the declaration of equator. Not guilty! Because he recognized his sins. He recognized his frailties and his filthiness. My dear brothers and sisters, so that no one would boast. The difference between a Pharisee and a publican is boastfulness. One thought that God was indebted to him. And the other thought that he was indebted to God. The song says, where the whole realm of nature mind, that was a tribute far too small. Nothing we can do to get the salvation of God. Well, brothers and sisters, notice what Ellen White says. Sister White, oh, I love this woman. She is a preacher of righteousness by faith. She says in Reviewing Herod, October 24, 1893, Notice that these messages are actually what you call her 1888 messages. They are the messages she wrote in view of what happened in 1888. Minneapolis. Notice what she says. I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, 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 for a moment. Notice what Ellen White says. She says how inappropriate it is to condemn others. Just like that guy. When every soul is to be saved not on his own merits but by the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. Hallelujah. We are all erring, finite creatures, accountable to God for our words, our works, our influence. She continues uh, by saying, by the use of this parable. Uh, by the way, let me get this one. Very good. It says, very good. She says, yeah, by the use of this parable, he, referring to Jesus Christ, teaches them that the reward is not of works, lest any man should boast. But it is, let us read that together. It is all of grace. Let's read that together again. It is all of grace. All of grace. Brothers and sisters, yes, she is again. Anyone says, in salvation, 
in salvation, self-congratulation has no place. Self-congratulations has no place. God expects only self-denial, self-death, in order that Christ may reign in our hearts as supreme without any competitor. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity rocked out a perfect character and this character he offers to impart to us. He imputes his righteousness to us in justification. Then he impart his character to us in sanctification. The first is our title to heaven and the other is our fitness to heaven. Hallelujah! Brothers and sisters, the funeral was held of a very, very remarkable man. This man by the name of David was a remarkable man. He actually was remarkable in his steady demeanor. Through 33 years of service with the same ministry, he was remarkable in his gentle and caring love for his wife. He was married for 30 years with no problems. He was very remarkable in his unwavering care for his children. He took care of his children very well. Remarkable in when he died too suddenly and too soon at the age of 56. No one had anything bad to say about this man. Remarkable man. Friends and family members came to his funeral. And they began to give their tribute to David. David was a converted Christian. David was a faithful father. David was a faithful husband. David was a good man. David was a gentleman. David was a faithful man. And after the tribute, the sermon was about to be preached. And the pastor took the stand. And the pastor said, none of the good things David did earned him one second in the presence of God. None of the good things David did will ever earn him one second in the presence of God. He is there or he will go to heaven. He will go to heaven. He will be accepted by God because of Jesus Christ. Yeah, brothers and sisters, it is true. No matter how remarkable our lives are, we cannot earn heaven. No matter how punctual we have been to church, we cannot earn heaven. No matter how many Sabbaths we have observed from sunset to sunset, we cannot earn heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not possible. It is not of works. Lest any man should boast. Brothers and sisters, oh, Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, but God forbid that I should boast. Save in the cross of our Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom the word is crucified unto me and I unto the word. Brothers and sisters, the cross is it. The cross is the basis. The cross is the reason for our redemption. The song says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest king account but loss and poor contempt. On all my pride. For barely, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ, my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Dear brothers and sisters, listen to what Ellen White says. Dear Adventist brothers and sisters, listen to what Ellen White says about the cross of Jesus, the centrality of the cross. Ellen White says, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. She says, I present there before you the great the grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption. She says, the Son of God uplifted on the cross of Calvary. This is to be the theme of every discourse. Christ declares, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. Listen to me, preachers, elders who can preach, 
pastors who can preach, members who can preach. Listen to what Ellen White says. She says, in Review and Herald, February 3rd, 1891, she says, many sermons preached upon the claims of the law have been without Christ. Without Christ. And this lack has made the truth inefficient in converting souls. The sermon can't even move a flower. If it is fault of Jesus Christ. She says, without the grace of Christ, it is impossible to take one step in obedience to the law of God. Then how necessary that the sinner hear the love and power of his redeemer and friend. Without me, says Christ, you can do nothing in and through the grace of Christ. We can do all things. By the way, Ellen White also said, in Review and Herald, March 11, 1819, she says, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gebua. You know the hill of Gebua? We are as dry as the hill of Gebua that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. Where is Christ in your preaching? Why is Christ in your law? Listen to what Ellen White says. She says, very interesting, and this is from uh, uh, Gospel Workers 301, paragraphs 1 and 2. She says, our churches are dying for the want of teaching on the subject of what? Righteousness by faith in Christ. Righteousness by faith in Christ. She says, and, in, uh, and on kindred truths. No matter by whom light is sent, we should open our hearts to receive it with the meekness of Christ. Every time I preach this message, there has been some kind of Adventist response. Are you there with me? Are you there with me? I was doing a series on the book of Romans in my church. And an Adventist response was, the pastor is like, uh, got to say a little bit about law. I have not reached the Romans chapter 6, chapter 7, and so on. You, you, you know you got to balance the truth. I preached this message to, uh, message to one church just a couple, you know, uh, days or so ago. And then a lady came to me, oh, pastor, after the first message, thank you, pastor. But you know what, pastor? I was just telling my children this morning about the danger of the cheap grace. Basically, she might have been implying that I was preaching cheap grace. Are you kidding me? Basically, I'm, my Adventist brother will say, you know, when you say we are saved by grace, you got to add that we have to work a little bit, you know. Are you there with me? This thing is simple. There has been a great debate on that. How would you say we are saved by grace or we are saved by faith? Then you say, let me use the word justified. We are justified by faith. Right? We are declared right by faith. But the Bible also teaches that we are judged by works. Jesus said, my reward is with me to give to every man according to what? His works. Are you there with me? The Bible says that Paul, he said, we will all appear before the judgment seat and we give account for what we have done. So we are saved we are justified by faith. But how come we are judged by faithfulness? Simple. We are justified by faith. But we are judged by faithfulness. Because the faith by which we are justified inspires faithfulness. Are you there with me? The faith by which we are justified inspires faithfulness. That is why judgment begins in the house of God. That is why there will be more severe judgment on the people of God than the rest of the world. You know why? To whom much is given, much is suspected. The power to live right is given to you by the Holy Spirit. So if you are still sleeping with someone you're not married to, if you are still committing adultery, if you are still stealing the church funds and stealing in government and doing all manner of things, there is something wrong with your faith. Are you there with me? Just as simple as that. 
But guess what? Let me be very emphatic. The faithfulness by which we are judged is the faithfulness of Christ. Because it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. That the works which I now do, I do unto the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, it is Christ in me that is the hope of glory. That is the hope of heaven. That is the message, brothers and sisters. All you need to do is allow Christ to live his life in you. And whatever you do as a result of that is called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is not your fruit. It is the fruit of the Spirit that he is simply flourishing in your life. God have mercy. Let me conclude. Let me conclude, uh, brothers and sisters, to tell you that I'm not surprised if some Adventist takes some exception to the message of justification by faith. As a matter of fact, do you all know that I'm not the one who gave the team of this year's camp meeting? Are you all aware of that? Are you all aware that this theme does not even come from the local church? This theme comes from where? Is it the conference or the union? The theme of the camp meeting, uh, saved by grace. Where does it come from? From the union or the conference, right? So I was lying down comfortably in my house when pastor told me the theme is saved by grace. And what I have discovered in getting these messages prepared and even preaching them is more than whatever I had knowledge of concerning the gift of God and the grace of God. Thank you for inviting me. It has inspired me. It has transformed me. But ladies and gentlemen, one day, more than I think 40 years after the SDA church was founded, one day they had a general conference session. At the general conference session of 1888, they set out or they agreed to discuss the law in Galatians. That was a purpose. Th that was just like the last general conference. We were seriously debating on women ordination. Divisions being allowed to actually ordain women. At that general conference, it was a heated discussion on the law in Galatians. As they were discussing the law in Galatians, there were two guys who came. One of them is called A.T. Jones. And the other is called E.J. Wagner. A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner decided that instead of just talking about the law in Galatians, they started to talk about justification by faith. Righteousness by faith. So the establishment, are you there with me? The establishment, the GC president and the tough guy like Uriah Smith, who were the theologians of our church, they said, no, this is false doctrine. No, you're spoiling the church. You're encouraging sins. We don't want it. The church was rejecting justification by faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, as the, as the top theologians of the church were trying to debate Wagner and Jones, the servant of the God of heaven, the messenger to the remnant church of God, who never attained anything higher than a third grade education, the servant of God decided to bring an end to the debate. Listen to what Ellen White said about those two boys who were preaching what I've preached to you since this week began. Listen to what Ellen White said. Ellen White considered their message of justification by faith or righteousness by faith as message from heaven. The loud cry, the lottery message, the matchless chime of Christ, the waves of truth, God's working, true religion of the Bible, message of his grace, the call of the Spirit of God. Every fiber in my heart say amen. Spirit of God and manifestation of the Holy Spirit meet in due season. Christ-like spirit, the voice of the true shepherd, divine credential, heavenly credential, large muscle from the Lord's table, rich blessing, lips touched with the life cold, feast of fat things and having sent refreshing. 
Are you kidding me? These are the appellations, the descriptions she gave to the message of the young guys. But listen to her exact words. She said, in a letter she wrote to Uriah Smith, the church big theologian, <laughs> he wrote a whole commentary on Revelation and Daniel. Notice what she said. She said to the guy, Uriah Smith, the message given by A.T. Jews and E.J. Wagner is a message of God to the Laodicean church. Justification is for Laodicean. Somebody will say, but Laodicean is a very ungodly church. What they need is the law. Are you there with me? It's a pompous church. Preach the law to them. But she said justification by faith is the message for the Laodicean church, the end time church. But here's what she also said. Testimonies to ministers, page 91. She says the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. She also says, very interesting, she says, testimony to the minister, page 92, she said the message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines. That the word should no longer say that seventh day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. The efficacy of the blood of Christ was to be presented to the people with freshness and power. Uh, 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 uh. Notice what she also says. God has most precious light for his people. I call it not new light, but oh, it is strangely new to many. Did you get that? Ellen White says it's not a new light. Because it was in the Bible, in Paul, in, in, in Abraham, in David, righteousness was by grace. She said it's not a new light, but it is strangely new to many. Strangely, meaning it should not be, but it is. Here's the final quote I'm going to read to you. Ellen White says, Manuscript 5, 1889, one year after 1888. Ellen White said, I have had the question asked, what do you think of this light that these men are presenting? Who are the men? Wagner and Jones. <laughs> so they're asking the prophet, they say, woman of God, what do you think? Listen to her response. Why I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years. Amen. Anyone say for the last 45 years I've been preaching to you righteousness by faith. For the last 45 years, the muchless charms of Christ. Then she says, this is what I have been trying to present before your minds. But yes, why it's uh, very striking. She says, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard excepting the conversation between myself and and my husband. Meaning that in their house, they used to talk about righteousness by faith. But the first time she ever heard a human being talk about it was when Wagner talked about it. Then she says, I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly. And they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. Then she says, I like this response. She said, and when another presented it, when Wagner and Jones presented it, every fiber in my heart said, Amen. 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 Every fiber in my heart said, Yes, sir. It is true. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. But brothers and sisters, as we close, I need you to notice this. About my friend Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a teen, a very young man. And he was asked to go and preach his, at his grandfather's church, okay? And uh, as he was going, there was a traffic, so he got to the church very late. Before he got to the church, his grandfather started to preach. And his grandfather was preaching on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. 
So when he heard someone walking into the church, he saw his son, Charles Spurgeon. And so he said, Charles, come and preach because you are able to preach better than I can. Please come and preach. Charles told his grandfather, no, you are a better preacher. Please continue. His grandfather insisted. His grandfather refused. And his grandfather actually explained to Charles where he was in the sermon. And Charles took the pulpit and began to preach. This younger preacher stepped onto the pulpit and he took over just where his grandfather had left, uh, left off. And after a few meetings, the grandfather interrupted, wanted to preach a little more. And Charles picked it on and began to preach. Then he, uh, the grandfather sat down and Charles resumed and he began to preach. As the grandfather was sitting down, Charles was preaching and the grandfather was saying, Good! Charles! Tell us that again. Charles, tell us that again. After that, my brothers and sisters, Charles said that whenever he preached from Ephesians chapter 2, he could hear his grandfather whispering, tell us that again. Tell us that again, Charles. Brothers and sisters, the message of Ephesians chapter 2 is a message that must be told again, again, and again. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of the beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. The present message. Justification by faith, Ellen White says, is a message from God. It bears the divine credentials for its fruit is unto holiness. God bless you. Praise God. What do you say to that wonderful someone? Amen. Let us rise up with our theme song, song number 338. Let's sing. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed. Redeemed.
by the blood of the Lamb. Free salvation, free grace. Today, if you will accept his grace, kind of lift up your hand as we pray. Lift up your hand as a surrender, as an indication that every fiber in your heart is saying, Amen. 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 In Jesus' name, at the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.